truth about preaching. The truth about preaching and preachers. Let me read you a few scriptures to begin with. In Galatians 1, 16, it says, To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. To reveal his son in me, that I might preach. The order of those words are very important. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. And it says in 1 Corinthians 2.1, And brethren, I came to you not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, all across this country, and especially in the city, all across this city, there's a lot of sincere preachers standing up this morning with hearts to really move people to closer to God, to try to get people to want to press in with Jesus, to really see who he is and walk with him. Like I said, and they're out of sincere hearts, they're trying. It can be very discouraging at times to be in ministry if you're coming at it from the wrong way. And so there's many men out there that are, that are working, and it can be very discouraging. They're not trying. When I say they're trying to get people to move towards closer to God and to walk with God, I don't mean that they're doing it in a, in a, necessarily in a wrong way. I mean, there are ones that are charlatans and ones that are interested in fame and interested in money and interested in all those things. We don't speak about those guys. They should be chased out of town on a rail. But there's many that, that want to do that. They're trying to pick their words maybe right. Some are trying to maybe use harsh words to drive people closer to God. Some are trying to come up with words that would seem softer in this way or that and trying different things. But when we do that, we've lost the power of preaching. Something that I said months and months and months ago even here, I said, look, I'm not trying to drive you somewhere. The Lord is not trying to just to try to get us to see something or, or try to open things up so that people can understand things necessarily in this way or that. We're simply, we're saying months and months ago, we're, we want to proclaim and we want to bring forth the testimony of the Lord and believe God that he will distribute his truths within our hearts, that the Holy Spirit will be at work. Amen? And we've lost that so much. We've lost it so much even in our, in, in our preaching, in what's behind everything. We see these words of Paul when he says, it pleased God to reveal his son in me that I might preach. You see, there is no preaching unless Christ has been revealed within your heart. We can preach facts and we can preach figures and we can preach truths as standing upon themselves. You hear a lot about that now because truth has fallen in the streets. So you hear a lot on, on this side or that side and saying These are, this is the truth and this is the truth and this is the truth. And there's elements of light to that. But the truth is Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the truth. And Jesus Christ was revealed within Paul. So Paul began to preach. There is no real preaching without the revelation of Jesus. There can't be. It's impossible. All it gets to be is just teaching. All it gets to be is just words. And this is why Paul says these words. And I find it so fascinating because Paul says, I came not to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the power and the spirit that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the, power, in the wisdom of God. He says in the verse before it, Brethren, I came to you not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. In other words, Paul is, if we see these words for what they are, Paul is saying, look, when I came to you into the Corinthian church, I was weak. And I didn't use fancy words and I didn't lose excellency of speech. I didn't use the wisdom of men. But see, we struggle with that today. Even modern preachers will say Paul was such a great orator and Paul was so intelligent and Paul was this. And those things are possibly true. He was a, if he was a, attached to the Pharisees, as we know, he studied under Gamaliel. We know he could read and write, which, by the way, many were illiterate in a lot of these churches, right? At those times, not necessarily the Jews, because they usually had a school attached to the synagogue, but many of these other cultures were like that. 
So Paul, Paul, you can see from his writing, he was, he was, he had a, he had a sharp mind. I'm sure he was taught in many of the ways and knew how to use words excellency, excellently. But here we can see that he did not use that. And yet much of our preaching today, much of our preaching today is based on using excellent words and how to have things just right and how to have everything perfectly. And Paul is saying the opposite. I'm always amazed at that. But we have our, our, the Bible, and, and yet we go the opposite way. When we don't just strip everything away and see what it says, he says, I came not with you, not to you with excellent speech or of wisdom, declaring you the testimony of God. What was he declaring? The testimony of God. Every, every, any one of you, if Christ has been revealed in your heart, you can testify to that. You don't have to use perfect words. You don't have to use the wisdom of the world and all those thoughts to the way the world does. You have a testimony. What do you do? You simply testify. Paul is testifying to Christ that's been revealed in him, to Christ that he saw in his vision, the Christ that he knows, the Christ that saved him, the Christ that filled him, the Christ that called him. He's testifying to that. This is what he's doing. And why did he do that? Why did he stand in front of this church and say, listen, when I came to you, I didn't use excellency of speech. I didn't use the wisdom of the world. We've been talking about this for a long time, how humanism has so infiltrated our society and infiltrated the church that many times we don't realize we're using that kind of wisdom. It says in James says the wisdom of the world is devilish. And yet many times we try to use the wisdom of the world. We try to marry up Christianity with so many of those things, with capitalism or Americanism and all those things, and it just doesn't work. There's truths that are, that are, that are folded in, and in into our society because it was founded on some very good things. Stewardship, hard work, all those things are very good. But we can't take those things and try to build a Christianity out of them. We have to see that our Christianity is based on this, Jesus Christ. It's based on this, the power of God. The power of God. In other words, this morning, if we don't really believe the power of God in the preaching or the power of God in our hearts, in our hearts, this is why there's some frustration even, even between preachers that really have the Holy Ghost, preachers that really have a heart for God. Because if we're really not believing and teaching the people and telling the people, listen, you have an unction from the Holy One. The Holy Ghost lives in you. I don't care if you're loud or you're quiet. You don't feel like you're a spiritual giant or whatever. Quit comparing yourself to other believers. You have to sit there this morning and know the Holy Ghost lives in me. The Holy Ghost lives in me. And I have an unction from the Holy One. And if words come forth that are from the Lord, they're going to do something within my heart. In demonstration and power he came. Now we've pulled away a little bit of this because over the last few decades and decades in the past, we've had, we've had a lot of demonstration and God wants demonstration, but then man gets his eyes and his hands on that and we think unless, unless we demonstrate something in a meeting, the Holy Ghost isn't there. So we've, like I said, we've fallen into these, these categories of either the church is dead as a doornail or people are running around trying to demonstrate all kind of stuff and it's hurting people. But it says the power of God. The power of God to do what? The power of God is the power of the cross. And the power of the cross does what? It changes man where he cannot be changed. It touches man where, where, where philosophies in the world and everything of the world cannot touch. God can change your heart this morning. God must change your heart this morning. God must change our hearts this morning because God wants something and he's not going to get it even from this, group, this assembly, unless he, we let him change our hearts. And he's able to do it. Amen? Paul's reminding the Corinthian church, when I came to you, you, there was a demonstration of the power of God. You know, whenever God starts something, whenever a church is birthed, usually there's a demonstration of power. When God started our ministry years ago, there was a real demonstration of power. God, God broke out, even in a Catholic church. People were getting saved and filled with the Spirit. When I went overseas, there was a, a group of young people, and it was, there was a lot of, 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 of even, I, I say it carefully in that way, but even signs and wonders that God used. Because there was a breaking forth of what God wanted, but that power needed to consistently and, and completely go forward in changing lives.
But we, we put, put our trust in eloquency. We put our trust in what we know. We put our trust in our own intelligence. We put our trust in what we could do. And the whole point of this is that Paul said he wanted their faith to be based on what? Not on what he, how good he could preach. Not on his eloquence of speech. But simply on this. I want your, your faith to be based on the power of God. So here's this man. You see the work of the cross. Paul had to be a man of great intellect. He had to be a man that was educated. He had to be a man that knew how to preach. And, and he had to be a man because he was so steeped in the, in the law of Moses and the Pharisee, Pharisee law. He knew all these things. And yet he stands before them and said, I was with you in weakness. See, we don't understand that. We think, wow, if we have this, this preacher gets up that can't speak that well. He doesn't, doesn't, he's not eloquent of speech. And there's no like power in the way we think of power. Certainly it will be a boring meeting. Certainly people won't move forward in Christ. But there was a power going on here that we're not used to. The power of God. We see the predecessors before even Paul with Moses. When Moses said to the Lord, I'm not eloquent of speech, neither before or now. When you spoke to your servant, I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. This is what Moses said. But if we see the, the preaching of Stephen in chapter 7 in the book of Acts, Stephen says that, that Moses was versed in all the ways of the Egyptians. That he was mighty in speech indeed. Well, what happens from this prince of Egypt? Now he's, a, now he's a shepherd. Now he's a shepherd in the desert. And when God comes to get him, he says, I, 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 I. literally it means to stammer. I, I can't speak. I can't do this. Now there's some value in that, recognizing your weaknesses. But Moses, as we know, he went a little too far trying to beg himself off what God wanted and God began to get angry. But I always found it fascinating that this was a prince of Egypt. He was mighty in speech and in deed. And yet after 40 years in the wilderness, God says, now nah, he's ready. See, we don't think that way. No, no, don't use him. Don't use the bearded guy out on the backside of the wilderness. This is not the man you want to use. This is the man that ran away when he killed the Egyptian. This is the man who's been, who's been hidden away for years. This is a man who stammers and is slow of speech. Certainly you won't use him. God says, that's my man. Such to the point that he got his brother Aaron because he, he, he was afraid of his stammering speech. But God knew. And Aaron caused Moses no small problems in his life. But God knew this isn't what it's based on. It's not based on when you stand in front of Pharaoh, you're going to have the right things to say. You can say the eloquent things. You can, have them, you can have them dazzled by how you speak. God knew you can go up and you can stammer in front of him, but the power of God will be there. Who is this stands before me? This, this, this cloaked man with the beard and smells of sheep and he's got this staff. And who is he? Here's all my, here's all my magicians. Moses is like, Our, my God is up to this. There is evil out there today, such evil, and the church is not prepared to face it. The church wants to face it either with its intellect or with some kind of magic, but it's got to be the power of God. And some of you, some of you don't see that. You're looking for the power of God, and I'm telling you, if you've been saved, you love Jesus this morning, the power of God is in your life. The power to change your heart. When I came to Christ, I had a hard heart. Hard. As I said, I was not always the lovey, lovey, fuzzy guy I am today. Ask my wife. I was a, I was a hard-hearted, mean, young Italian boy. But Christ came, and he changed the power of God. I was searching hard. I searched in philosophies. I searched in reading. I read ravishly. I searched in drugs. I searched in all these things, trying to discover something that could touch my soul. And Christ came and touched my soul. This is the power of God. Forgive the reiteration of this testimony. I know you've heard it before, but I remember being as a young Christian in one of the largest churches in America. And the people were actually literally shouting, we want miracles, as the preacher was up there saying, who wants miracles? And I remember just looking around as if I wasn't a part of it, 
thinking, Lord, there's people in here with broken homes. There's people here on, on, the, on the cusp of divorce. There's people here addicted to drugs. There's people here with their thought life so out of place. All this is going on. They're crying for miracles. But where's the miracle of the power of God to change the heart? My God can do it. Amen? The brother prayed this morning as we prayed for the word. I tell you, the Holy Spirit is among us. If we open our eyes... The word is near thee, even in your mouth and in your heart. It is the word of faith which we preach. Where's the word of God? It's in your mouth. Paul says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, foolishness but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. What does Paul say? He says he didn't preach with wisdom of words to make the cross unaffect, unaffected. That's not saying words aren't important. I personally love words. I've always loved words since I was a little kid. I like to use right words. That's why, that's why I can't watch most of the stuff that a lot of people watch or be around. They say, well, I don't talk like that. Words mean something to me. And when people are using the filthiest curse words they can constantly, those words mean something to me. And I'm like, why would you? I don't want to listen to you say that. I feel like stopping people with such filth coming out of their mouth saying, do you know, even know what that word means? Do you know what you're saying constantly? Good words are effective. But what it's saying is that we don't put our faith in them. We put our faith in what? Jesus. Not just saying the word Jesus, but we put it in what the person who Jesus is. We put it in at all that he's done. You see, God's got to do it is what I'm trying to tell you. God's got to have a people. I've been doing this a long time. And you can try to move people to God and get people to see things. I'm telling you, you can't even get people even to show up to church, the only way you can get people to church is that you have to have multiple services. You have to have comfortable chairs. You better not go more, preach more than, more than 45 minutes. The music has to, be, has to be perfect, everything, just to get people to listen to some 45-minute placebo of the gospel. There's got to be a hunger, and that hunger can only happen. It's, not, it's only going to happen. By the power of God. By the power of God. Weeks ago, as I began to pray and look out, and even across the, the Christian landscape, I began to see God. I, I don't understand. There's no, these, for most Christians today in America, there's, there's no reason for them even to be hungry. They have their Bibles. They can, they're on their phone. They can have their app. They can have a teaching. They can, they can do their, their, their video thing. They can, they can watch. They can listen to preaching in their pajamas. They love being preached to. They love hearing teachings. There's more books, more everything on every subject you can ever imagine. Of the writing of books, there is no end, it says in Ecclesiastes. But we're no closer to God. But these men, these men, how could Paul do that? Think about it. He got up in weakness. He got up and not using eloquent words. He didn't use anything of the world to move people towards it. And yet, they were moved. For the preaching of the cross is to them that, that perish foolishness, but unto us it is the power of God. It says in other scriptures that God chose by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. You see, to us when we say that, it's like the foolishness of preaching. We've so, we've so dressed it up. It's not, it's not foolish. It's a great idea the way we present it in our American way, the way we sell the gospel. But really, it's foolishness. It's just foolishness. And the only way you're going to be saved is if you look at that foolishness that you're being told that God came down in the, in, in the image of, of man and that through what looked like failure, through what looked like defeat, through, through what looked like, like, like death in, 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 in finality. That he took the sins of the world and that he saved you. I'm still saying it this morning and I'll say it again. We still are not awed by the power of the cross and what God has done. As we sing that song, it says, we're amazed at your story. People aren't amazed at it. If they were, if they were amazed at it, there'd be more worship, more real worship, more real praise. 
You know, when I was a young believer, sometimes I'd hear those old-time gospel preachers and they just preach on the cross. I'd want to stand up on my chair and scream hallelujah over simple words. Some of these simple preachers and shambocking them just get them preach on the cross of God. And I'd want to just shout yes because it wasn't their words. It wasn't just their demonstration. It wasn't their, their emotion. It was something in me, amen. It was in me, the Holy Ghost in me. And we've stolen from the believers today in this country. Every believer, we have teaching after teaching. We're so headstrong. If we'd stop it all and just say, all we want to talk about this morning is this, are you saved or not? And if most of the people in the congregation, because there's so many and many congregations that aren't saved, if, if most of the people would say, I am saved, you're saved, then take the time and know this God of the universe lives inside of you. The King of the universe lives inside of you. The God who made the stars, the God who made the sun. He lives inside of you. As a little boy, I would, would sit in mass and the priest would turn around. In those days, they didn't even face us because they spoke in Latin. And he, they'd go to this little thing called this, the tapestry or whatever it was called, and they'd open this little door, and that's where they kept the communion wine the host, and they'd tell us, God lives in there. And I would think, God lives in there? God lives in there? My God is too small. My God is locked up. My God is trapped in religion. And then 40 years ago, it was when I got saved in my home, when, my, when I was an empty shell, when there was nothing in my heart but me, 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 and everything the world had put inside of me. On that fateful day when I cried out to Jesus Christ, not really knowing who He was, and all of a sudden, fire came into my soul. All of a sudden, from my head to my feet, I was like, I was warmed. All of a sudden, I felt like I was given a bath on the inside, and I knew He lives. He lives inside of me. And the next morning I got up and just to get up and open my eyes and oh my God, he lives inside of me. Even when I fail, he lives inside of me. When I doubt, he lives inside of me. I'm not saying we lived our li live our lives in some euphoric uh, uh, experience constantly, but I'm saying this for every believer. How many believers are out there, even some of you sitting here this morning, that you've never really, really, really known that touch of God because you've not been encouraged to really know, listen, He lives inside of you. He loves you. You don't have to worry about demonstrating something on the outside or some physical thing on the outside or some Holy Ghost thing on the outside, but I'll tell you this, on the inside you got to have that witness. On the inside, it's like, yes. The problem is there's, there's, there's two types of believers. Not, and what I mean by that, there's not the believers that are good and the believers that are bad. They're not the believers that are deep and the ones that aren't. They're not the believers that are going on and the ones that are, the one, that are not. But there's two types. And I'm going I'm to read a quote from our friend Austin. To understand there's one type of believers that walk not with something to be attained. They don't realize they're walking on something to be attained, but not something already attained. Not something that ought to be lived up to, but someone to live with. The, death, the vast difference between these two things is that outworking can hardly be measured. It is Christ, the power of God. Now, when we've said that, we've opened the way to see just what the Lord Jesus is. And we can never get outside of that. And we never want to. But it is very important that we should see exactly what this means. In other words, there's, there's many believers that are still trying to obtain something. They're struggling. They're striving. Instead of realizing it's already been, and it's already been attained. There's so many believers that are trying to struggle out from under the guilt and the shame and to try to be good Christians and to try to obtain more, try to get more knowledge, try to understand more. There's all this striving. Then there's the ones that believe it's done. It's done. It's done. That's the great difference today in the believers. Even talking about a deeper life and the overcomers, even talking about the remnant, if people talk about it in the wrong way, then it's simply more of I'm going to be more advanced. I'm going to know more. I'm going to achieve more. That's completely wrong. You overcome here, simply here, and simply in this, the work's been done. The work's done. You're beginning to overcome. I believe in the finished work of the cross. You're beginning to overcome. 
I want nothing but the will of God in my life, not through my own strengths, but through yielding to Christ. You begin to overcome. But you look in the world, what does the world value more than anything? They value aesthetics. They value the way things look. They value wealth. They value knowledge above everything else. Education is how we've wrecked so many things in this country in the last 20 years. We've taught every kid, listen, unless, unless you go to the highest education, we got kids with 50, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars worth of debt, and they should have been out there working on a car. But we've told all of them, unless you have changed the highest of education. Now, that doesn't mean education's wrong. Trust me. I want the kid working on my car to be apprenticing under a mechanic since he's 16. And I want the brain surgeon that's going to operate on somebody's brain to go to school forever. But we value those things. Do you see that? Ask yourself, what does the church value? You can see it. We value all the wrong things. Instead of this, as Oswald Chambers said, doctrine is important. Thesis are good. Teaching is necessary, but let everything stand aside for this, your relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen, always the way forward to deeper, fuller, more fruitfulness is always Gilgal. Always the cross. It's always accomplished by faith and the power of God and carried out by his hands. Before they crossed over the Jordan, which, which means going into the promised land. Before they crossed over to the Jordan, which means going into the deeper life with Christ. They crossed the Red Sea, that's salvation. The Jordan was that what had to happen? Gilgal, circumcision had to happen. And what did Jeremiah say? You men of Israel, circumcise your, 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 yourselves, circumcise your hearts. Our hearts have to be opened again. Look at society. It's all closed off hearts. Even in the church, it's a closed off heart. That's why so many marriages are in trouble. Hearts are closed off. Why so many churches struggle and divisions and splits. People's hearts are, are closed off. When's the last time you really opened your heart to anyone? That's what happens when you get saved. You open your heart completely. Amen? Wouldn't that be good to see people get saved like that again? Where they just throw their hearts open to Jesus. Whatever. But they don't. They get saved and they're like, okay, you got saved, but keep your heart to yourself. And I'm telling you, some of you in this room, you don't think you do, but, you, but you're still keeping some of your heart back from the Lord. Afraid that God will hurt you, but you know God will never hurt you. Is that right? You throw your heart open to Jesus, he may take you down the roads that get difficult. Amen. Jeremiah at times said, Lord, what are you doing? Peter didn't understand where the Lord was going. Even Paul said, prayed three times, Lord, take this away from me. What's going on? Until God spoke to him. But we have to trust, amen? But we're losing that, aren't we? Even with little ones, you look at them and say, listen, you just have to trust me. I still tell my grandchildren we're going to do this. Why? Why? Don't ask me why. Trust. You teach your kids to trust. Parents don't teach their kids to trust anymore. They explain everything to them. Husbands and wives don't trust each other. Wives don't trust their husbands. I could get hurt. You probably will get hurt. If your heart's open, you're going to get hurt. Husband or wife, it's going to happen. But if you love each other, then it's going to get taken care of and you're going to go deeper. And we certainly hurt the Lord at times, but he never hurts us. He may, lay hurt, he may let hurt come in our lives and difficulty come in our lives, but it's always for our better good. Amen? Can you imagine a people in these days that are living open-heartedly? Not foolishly. Not foolishly in the way that, 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 that they're taking advantage of casting pearls before a swine, but a group of people that have their hearts open. I cannot tell you how many times over the last few decades I've been taken advantage of even in the kingdom. How many disappointments there have been with people. How many people I've sought walk away or people that have just taken advantage of me or, 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 or the church or whatever. Some of it I wish I'd have done differently. Some of it I wouldn't change for anything. It's like, Lord, it was right. I had my heart open, and I kept my heart open. I was just taken advantage of. But I know that you're in charge, God. I know that you're in charge. 
You see, we've got to open our hearts. Some of that's happening to you. Some, I can see it. I can hear it when you brothers pray. I can talk when you sisters talk. I can hear it. I know that's from the Lord. That's from the Lord. It's not just reiterating things. There's things in your heart. But how much more is in there? How much more is in there? But we're holding it back. We're afraid to just, to just let go and throw our hearts into things. But it's getting to know him. This is the thing that every believer needs to know. This is the thing, once again, like I've said so many times, I wish I could just shake every believer in this city and say he lives in you. doesn't matter if you're intellectual or not intellectual. It no matter what your struggles are. It doesn't matter if he gave you great gifting to preach or to serve or you feel you have no giftings at all. He lives in you, amen? He lives in you. And so many go into these churches and the mega churches, they listen to the pastors and then they go back to apply all the teachings they have and wonder why it doesn't work. It doesn't work because your situation is different from pastor disaster and a smiling wife with their $5,000 teeth. It's completely different. You need to go home and know Christ lives in me. The word of God came this morning and I received the word, but that word's going to work out inside of me. It's going to flow out in my situation. Can you see that? Can you sense what that looks like? Instead of it looking like a people that are gathering just on a Sunday morning and then God is with them for that moment, then they go out and maybe they witness. No, it's like they go out and all of a sudden God is distributed. He's multiplied in every situation. You see, we don't become preachers of the gospel because we've read somewhere that Christ was crucified and raised from the dead and ascended. It's not because of historical facts. It's because God's revealed something in us. Not facts, but a person in relation to the facts. And the facts in relation to the person. Amen? It's more than just facts. It's more than just knowing in our head. You see it because it comes down to trust. We trust our intellects or we trust our emotions. You ever seen that? You see Christians that live in their heads where well, they understand it all. Are there other Christians that just trust their emotions? You ever met ones like, I felt this on Sunday or I felt that. I felt this, I felt this, I felt this, I felt this. And what we have to trust is the God that's inside of us. Amen? To put our hand in his hand and say, take me where you want, God. This is where the cross has such effective work. Because we learn not to trust in ourselves, amen? Is that not what happened to those, those 11 men? Or whoever the other, the, the other 109 that were on the, up in, the, in the upper room? They went through the cross. They saw all their hopes of the kingdom the way they thought to be built were dashed. The future dashed. Even their own things, they, what they were sure of within their own hearts, they saw that they were incapable of doing, and yet they got Pentecost. Why? Because it was now based on what? The power of God. Do you see that this morning? When we say the power of God, we're not talking about the power of the intellect or the power of powerful words or the power of, of enticing words or the power of, of, of theological di diplomas. We're, not, or we're also not talking about just demonstration of Sister Lulu's out there prophesying or Brother Bubba's doing something. What we're talking about is the power of God inside a believer that can change your heart. Amen? This is what we need today. And God can do it. God not only can do it, God will do it. You have to, put, you have to believe this morning too. Do you understand that now? It's not why listen to some preacher and being amazed at his words and say, he has faith. It's the faith of God in the congregation. Can you see that? The faith of God in every believer that goes home and says, I believe God is at work. I believe God can do this. Sure, we get weary. Sure, we get discouraged. And some of times, and this is some of you in the room too, and, and us, we cloak it, we cloak it with the humility of, okay, Lord, you know, I know I've failed so many times, and it's all me. It's my fault, God. It's my fault. We go on and on instead of really standing there saying, God, you can do this. But what we want to say is, God, you can do this, but here's all my excuses, or here's all my failures. Instead of saying, God, let's clear all that out of the way, and let's just believe for you to do this, God. God is honored by faith, amen? What has moved God? What God's moved by is faith. 
And he's moved by tears. And he's moved by the heart of his people. He's moved with compassion. And he's moved by faith. We've got to hear the heart of it. I can hear a very eloquent preacher, and it can, it can still be the Holy Ghost, even though he's eloquent. The Holy Ghost is in that man's heart, and I can sense it. I can hear other eloquent preachers and think, while people are dazzled, I'm sitting there like, this doesn't do anything. <clears throat> Same thing with much of the Christian music today. There can be a song and have all the right words and all the right music, and I'm sitting there saying, there's nothing to this. And then I can hear the simplest song, and I can say, God, there's something in the reality of Christ there. Paul said, I want your faith to be based on the power of God, not on him, not on the kind of words he used, but on the power of God self. To move from here to where God wants to take us, to go from faithfulness to faith, takes some movement within your hearts. Because the humanism is not going to like what's coming. Amen? And what's coming is the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said this when he came upon the earth. He was standing in the synagogue. And they asked him to read. And he opened the, the book was opened up. And this is what he read. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel. To the poor. Who gets the gospel preached to them? To the poor, amen? They always have the gospel preached to them. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Are there a lot of brokenhearted out there? Their hearts are broken everywhere. To preach deliverance to the captives. Are people captive? People have never been more captive than they are in this country. Recover the sight of the blind. To set at liberty those that are bruised. This is, the, this is what Jesus came to do. He came to do these things. We don't see these things happening. We see people growing in their knowledge of, of Christianity. We see teachings. We see charity. We people see people discussing things on social media and going back and forth. We see all that, but we, it's a, that's not enough. This is what we need to see. We need to see the poor having the gospel preached to them. Amen? As Frankie talked about our conversation with Oscar. Oscar's already feeding the poor. He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for anything. He just started feeding them. And we said, we're right with you 100%. We want a part of this. He was sent to heal the brokenhearted. We need to begin to believe, to pray for people and say, God can heal your broken heart. I love that because, you know, we, we can try to do some outward thing or something, but, but, but this, is, this is something that only God can do. God will heal the broken heart. Look at all the divorce. Look at all the sin. Look at all the fornication. Look at all the broken families. How many kids are out there brokenhearted? Brokenhearted just from, just from divorce. Completely brokenhearted. And the answer is not, listen, if you have this teaching, the answer is not another, another book about divorce or another book about marriage. The answer is Jesus can heal it. Not like you can think differently. You can program yourself differently. Those are lies of the devil that come from the humanism. It has to start here. There needs to be a miracle. And only God can do that miracle. Amen? Heal the brokenhearted. Some of you, I want to encourage you because I'm in the same way. Some of you praying for friends, praying for family members, praying for children, praying for loved ones. It seems impossible. But all it is, is God is going to get more glory. Amen? He is not ready to cast this generation aside. He wants to heal them. We need a mighty power of God to do it. To preach deliverance to the captives, recover the sight of the blind, set at liberty those that are bruised. This is the work of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 58, verse 6, it says this. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands 
of the wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is that not the fast? This is what God is saying to us. Oh, Lord, we need to go fast. Lord, we need to pray more. I need to pull back. I need to get my life all in order. He's saying, no, start doing this. And whatever's hindering you from doing this, that's where your healing will come. And I'm telling you, God wants a release of the Spirit. And in many of you, there's still things blocking this. And God's dealing with me too, I'm telling you. That He wants freedom of movement. Complete freedom of movement. It's not there. Brother Frank, you don't understand. I get discouraged. Brother Frank, you don't understand. I get angry. Brother Frank, you didn't see this week I messed up. Well, all I know is the power of the cross takes care of that. Amen? The church is going to be surprised because God's going to use the ones they're not expecting to use. When I first came to Christ, I was so excited because I I realized that God was touching me, a young businessman, and other people that, that it seemed like I grew up in a religion where, where men wore robes and they went to school for 10 years and, and only, only certain ones could preach the gospel. And all of a sudden when I got saved, I realized, God, you're just touching and calling ordinary common men and women. The church is going to be surprised with who God begins to use. Is that not the way it always is? When Jesus came, they said, is not this Joseph's son? Is not this Mary's son? Aren't his sisters and his brothers with us? Who is this guy? That's where some of you are. Maybe your family, your relations, people you know, whatever, they they would be shocked. But God's going to use you. God is going to use you. Because we need to settle it this morning that this is the victory. Here's the victory. You want the secret to the victory? It's here. The victory is already won. That's the key. The victory is done. I have these things that are blocking me getting there. What can I do? What can I do? It's not up to you to do it. It's not up to your struggles. The victory is done. God's already done it. You need to begin to thank Him for His victory. Begin to open your heart and let Him deal with you. Amen? He deals with us as sons and daughters. Is that right? Do you see the power of that? It's not like you're, you're a foreigner. You're illegitimate, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. It's not what he got, does. He takes your illegitimacy. He takes your, 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 when you're a foreigner, and he says, come into my home. Come and be clean. Come and let me cleanse you. Come and let me make you your own. But there's all this wrong with me. Don't worry about it. Come and let me take you in. Now you're his, and now he deals with you as his. He deals with you in that way. Son, this isn't right in your life. Let's fix it. Daughter, come here, come here. Let me deal with this in your heart because I love you. You say, well, well, isn't God a harsh God? Uh, No, I don't think his nature is to be harsh at all. When we're in rebellion, when we kick against the prick, sometimes he has to be stern. I'd like to think as a father, I was, I was not a harsh father. I thought I was a kind father. But if my kids pitched a fit, it might seem a little harsh, only because I had to get them on the right track again. God deals with us as sons and as daughters from the aspect that the victory's already done. Amen? Now, what does that mean? And, and I'll, I won't keep you too much longer because either we're living in this mind game of like, the victory's done. I don't have a broken heart. I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me because I'm complete and whole. It's like you are complete and you are whole. That's the truth. But the truth also is in your completeness and the fact that you're his son, the fact that you're his daughter, we still live in this flesh and there's still things that might be wrong. Amen? But the work's already been done so he can deal with it. Something that's blocking you're holding on to. You don't have to go try to fix it. You don't have to pay some price for it. You simply have to let the Holy Ghost touch it and then realize, oh, you paid a price for this. Why am I holding on to it? I'm going to let go of it. See, those are those words in 1 John people stumble over. He that's born of God does not sin. 
But then he also says, if we, if we don't say that we sin, then we make ourselves a liar. In other words, he's wanting us to be honest. He wants you to know you're a son and daughter of God. It's not your nature to sin. You have something to drink from that's completely different. Amen? But you know what? There's only one perfect. And while we're still in this body and on this earth, you may make a mistake. And if you do, you confess it and you let go of it. Amen? So two last things before we close. I must address this. This lie that tries to hang over all of us that says it's too good to be true. I'm just going to be this brother that just, just struggles for a while and struggles and struggles. I'm just going to be this sister that's, that's always going to have these issues. It's a lie. Amen? When God wants us to be perfect, perfectly his. doesn't mean you won't have your struggles. I have my struggles and God is dealing with things, things in my life. I'm glad he's not dealing with some of the same things he was dealing with 20 years ago because I got the victory. But there's always a battle going on, amen? And all that does is increase the testimony, increase the testimony, increase the testimony. So the lie that it's too good to be true is a lie. You can have victory. You will have victory, and you will move forward. Will there be battles? Yes. Will there be opportunity for repentance? Of course, until we see Christ. But we can be moving forward, amen? We can see people, see people, the poor have the gospel preached to them. How that's going to happen? You're going to do it. We're going to see the brokenhearted heal. How that's going to happen? You're going to do it. Deliverance of the captives, how that's going to do it? We're going to do it. Recover the sight of the blind, we're going to preach it. Sever at liberty those that are bruised, who's going to do it? We're going to do it. Christ in you is going to do it. How's he going to do it? When he has freedom, freedom of expression. The moment you think, I'd like to pray for that person, I say, but you know, I had my struggles yesterday. See, those are lies. Freedom of movement. I might say the wrong three thing. Freedom of movement. Don't worry about it. Amen? This is what God wants from us. This is the fast he's chosen. And what does that mean? It means when you feel like I need to lock myself away and pray, if God's telling you to do it, do it. But if you're doing it because you're trying to get to a certain spot, it's wrong because you're already there. The victory's there. I need to pull back from everyone because I'm not quite right. That's wrong. God wants you to go forward. Do you understand what I'm saying? Prayer and fasting is important. But if it's done on a religious way to try to just achieve something, to bring something about that's already done, it's wrong. You fast and pray for one reason, to get back to what's already been done, to get a clear picture of the victory that's already there. Do you understand that? God loves us. God loves you. Some of the things that some of you are hearing in your heart and in your head about yourself is not God. Think about it. He doesn't use that kind of language with his children. He'll use sharp language. He'll even use something that seems stern, but always, you'll always recognize the love of God in it. Always. Amen? It'll always be followed by repentance, not depression, not discouragement, and not defeat. As I said, there's many preachers today. They're trying to use flowery words to encourage people, but there's no repentance. There's other preachers using harsh words to try to, to, try to, to beat people up enough that they'd repent. But you know what happens to those people? They never repent. They just get condemned. But what God wants is the people said, they're going to say, why, why, why do you have life, so much life? Why do you have so much liberty? Why do you have so much freedom? You're like, because I'm a person of repentance. They won't understand that. What do you mean? Because I repent. When I'm wrong, I just I let God deal with me. And all it produces is more life. See, that drives us Satan crazy. It's the work of the cross. Think about it. Satan had Jesus arrested. He had Jesus slandered. He had Jesus 
beat on his back with, with, with a cat of nine tails. He had Jesus mocked. He had Jesus slapped in the face. He had Jesus condemned. He had Jesus crucified. He had Jesus a, sword, a, a spear put in his side. Then they took the body down. Then they put it in the tomb. Then they, then they put the rock in front of the tomb. Then they sealed the tomb. Then Satan was ready to dance and said, surely we've defeated him. And all it produced was life, life, life. And that's what happens to you and I when we open our hearts fully. It's like the grave being opened again. Satan's like, I've condemned that one. I got that one to fall. I've, I've told that one they're wrong. I've got that one to pull back. I've got that one to shut up. I've won. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you come out twice as strong as you've ever been. Hallelujah. He didn't know what to do with it. This is what God wants. This is what God wants in our assemblies. Not, oh, and the preacher gets up. If he uses the right words, people will be convicted. It's like, no. What, just assembling together with the life of God, and I believe people are going to repent. Amen? And if these words this morning have had any effect at all, it's only because, and I pray with all my heart and sincerity that the Holy Spirit would be upon me this morning, but also that the Holy Spirit would be upon you and inside of you, and that the power of God would be at work. That this morning you would lay down your disappointments. You would quit this, this childish thing that we do of saying, I'm disappointed when this, when this prayer is answered, when this disappointment is, is soothed, then I'll go forward. No, God says go forward now. When I feel better about myself, when this happens or that happens, God says no, open your heart. We're like a little child that sits there pouting after they've been corrected or pouting because they don't get their way. What God wants is life. Amen? I'd always watch my children even after they were corrected, and some took longer than others, but I'd watch. At some point that life has to come back, and I want to see that life. And I'll tell you, Satan surely has done a lot in all our lives. My life too. In many ways, these last few years, in a lot of ways, have not been easy. A lot's even come against me and my wife and our family just to try to stop us, just to, not even to, to defeat us, but just get us to just pull back just a little bit. Just get you even me to a point of, you know, look in the mirror, the hair's gray or everything. You're older, just, just start slowing down. It's like, no, in the name of Jesus, we're going to go twice as much as we've ever been. Amen? Every one of you has a part to play. If you get your eyes off your, each other and get your eyes on Jesus and say, Jesus, heal me, sanctify me, use me, then God will begin to use you. Amen? And I want you to hold me that to that too. Amen? I want God to, to use me. But I know that if he's using me and not using the congregation, then, I, then I'm not doing what God wants me to do. Then I just fall into the American preaching where we just love preaching and we don't love Jesus and the effect that God wants to have. Amen? Are you willing to open your hearts this morning? I mean really open them. Open them to, open them to your disappointments. Open them even to your plans for the future or what you, your, your, the way you vision things. Everything's going to work out this way. Are you willing to put that on the altar? Put everything on the altar. And trust, not put it on the altar in the way of, I give it up because God just, this is what God wants. God has no value in our sacrifices in that way. What does he delight in? Here you go, God, I give everything up. He delights in this. Do you want this, God? I trust you. Here's Isaac. I trust you, Abraham said. Here's my children. I trust you. Here's my bank account. I trust you. Here's my relationships. I trust you. Here's my business. I trust you. Do you see that world out there? They trust nobody. They're taught as a little child, trust no one. We're going to trust Jesus this morning, amen? We need to trust him. I need to trust him. God needs to forgive, deal with me, forgive me for my pulling back at times. You need to forgive me if I pulled back at times. But the road before us is marked by this. Victory for those that are brokenhearted. 
Victory for the blind. The poor are going to have the gospel preached to them. Amen? The, the captives are going to be set at liberty. By what? By the power. By the power of God. we got to believe in that power of God. Believe in it this morning. Amen? Do you believe in it? Do you believe in the power of God to break the yokes in your life? It's got to happen. This may seem like a message that's, that's, that's veered from restoration, but it says that God will break the yoke of the Assyrians. What means when the, when the time is up and the people begin to return from Babylon, what does God say? You've been under the yoke of Babylon. You've been under the yoke of the world. I'm fixing to break it. It's got to break it here first. And then those, then those who begin to return to Jerusalem, when they come in with the yokes, the yokes must be broken. What's your yoke this morning? Is it discouragement? What's your yoke? Is it inferiority? What's your yoke? Is it anger? What's your yoke? Thought life that runs away? What's your yoke? That you're not even sure what it is, whatever it is, God can break that yoke this morning by the power of Jesus Christ. It's not too good to be true. Amen? We can go out these doors in victory. You say, but Brother Frank, by Wednesday, I, I, you know, I'm struggling again. It's like, has the work been done? Amen, the work's been done. So for you young ones, what's in front of you is not too good to be true. Run with it. And for those of us who've walked long enough and, and met the cross many times and, and there's been really opportunity for discouragement, let's give the devil a black eye. And let's just say we're going to be more excited for Jesus and go on stronger than we ever have. And for those of you who've always said, well, God's not going to use me. You need to repent of that too. God certainly will use you when he has freedom of movement. Amen? God can save with few or many. What was that word to those brothers weeks ago? A handful of you put a thousand to flight. Don't underestimate that. You brothers don't underestimate what God can do with, through you. And you sisters, you just hold tight because the world for a long time hasn't seen, hasn't really seen righteous sisters. I'm telling you, they won't know what to do, but God will, amen? By the actions of the brothers, people will be set free. And by the life of these sisters, there'll be conviction in people's lives just by their life and the prayer. All right, let's pray this morning. Anthony, come stand with me. My two witnesses will do this. We're just going to do this. We're just going to close ourselves in, in the name of Jesus. And you, you, know, you know your yoke. You know what it is. You know your thing. I want you to stand to your feet. That's all we're going to do. Just stand up, and we're going to pray, Jesus, to break this. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or anything because we're going to believe this, that the, the words that are preached, as I said, will have effect in the hearts. So as I pray, the Holy Ghost is going to work in you. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, we believe you to break every yoke in the name of Jesus. Break the yoke that is tried to be over this whole church and congregation of discouragement and defeat holding us back. Break that yoke in the name of Jesus. Over every brother in this room, God, break that yoke of guilt and shame and discouragement. Break that yoke, God, that says real men cannot have hearts that are really open and still be strong as lions. It's a lie. David said, thy, thy gentleness has made me great. On every sister and woman in this room, break the yoke, God, it says, with an open heart, there will be pain. But Lord God, there'll be victory. Just like Mary was told that a heart would pier a sword would pierce her heart. Well, it certainly did. But Father God, she was filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. Bless, Lord God, this congregation. Open things up like we've never seen before. God, have your way. Freedom of movement in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Amen.